In our last video series, we introduced the topic of three major events that were to happen in the 1930s. The rise of Japan, looking at disarmament, and specifically the rise of extremists like Benito Mussolini. Today, we're going to take these concepts and apply them in a whole new video and look at the weaknesses of the League of Nations in the 1930s. Hi everyone, this is Mr. Trio and this is the fifth video in our series, To What Extent Was the League of Nations a Success? This is our fourth focus point, which is how successful was the League in the 1930s? Now today we will be looking at three separate events and I would like to provide a framework to help you better understand the perspective in which we are going to take. First, we are going to look at what happened during these three events. We're going to look at what was accomplished through the events. And then finally, we're going to take a look at the world reaction. So essentially, that's our framework that we are going to apply for each of these three different events. Let's begin with the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931. The important context of what happened is that Japan had been damaged by the World Depression and its trade was reduced during this time period. Japan had been very dependent upon its silk industry for trade and that was one of the ways that they brought money into the country. Silk, however, was considered a luxury item and one of the problems of the World Depression is that people just didn't have money to buy things like silk. And that put Japan in a situation where it no longer had hard money in order to trade for the things that it needed, its raw materials. I'm sure that you remember this from the discussion from our last video. So one of the things that Japan accomplishes by its invasion of Manchuria is that it seizes rich areas of iron, agriculture, food in other words, and forest in Manchuria. And Japan really essentially saw this as an extension of its building empire uh, of the time period. Now, you might say, what was the world reaction to this event? Well, essentially, not much. Trade with Japan was not cut. And this goes back to one of the problems of this world depression that we've talked about. Nations did not want to cut trade because they were dependent upon it. Countries like Great Britain were concerned that its colonies in Asia, in places like Hong Kong, could be at risk if they were to upset the Japanese. So essentially, not much happens to Japan as a result of its invasion. There was a commission, which was known as the Lytton Commission, that condemns Japan for these actions, but it doesn't go any further than that. It did not suggest that a military action should be taken upon Japan, but because Japan is criticized by this commission that took over a year to establish, uh, essentially they leave the League of Nations in protest. In our second case study, we're going to discuss the World Disarmament Conference, which took place between 1932 and 1934. What is the context of this? 54 nations meet to discuss how each nation can reduce its number of arms. When we talk about disarmament, essentially this is one of those core Woodrow Wilson ideas, if you remember from his 14 points, is that if less nations have less guns and tanks and uh, soldiers, then the world will be more at peace. So this is the whole idea behind the World Disarmament Conference when people come together to discuss these important events. What is essentially accomplished through the World Conference? Not much, because essentially nobody trusted each other. Countries like France said, if we reduce our armaments, then we're more at risk for a future war. They still had no faith in its neighbors like Germany and believed that if they didn't um, defend themselves, then they would be more vulnerable in the future. I think that one of the things that the World Disarmament Conference really 
impacted and how the world reacted is that Germany, Japan, and Italy follow up with the conference by not reducing its number of military forces, but actually、um, strengthening its military forces. So, in other words, the conference had the opposite effect that it meant to have. Let's look at the last case study, which is the Italian invasion of Abyssinia. One of the things which is important for the context of this particular、um, case study is that Italy had had strong holdings in Africa、um, in the 19th century, and still by the time of the events of 1934, specifically in the area of Ethiopia. But this Nation of Sinia, which is in Africa, had humiliated the Italians 30 years before by defeating them in a war. So the real accomplishment of why Italy invaded Abyssinia during this time period is that it wanted to essentially regain its strength in this area. And the leader of fascist Italy at this time, Benito Mussolini. Was trying to get Italians proud of something and get them to support him, and certainly this was one of the things that he was able to do to show how strong he was. One of the things that is our world reaction and very important to keep a mind on is that even though many nations like Great Britain and France saw this as an egregious violation of international law. They saw it as pure aggression against a smaller, weaker nation. They were not openly critical of Italy, and in fact, they tried to establish backroom deals in order to give Italy something that it wanted, in order to pacify them, in order for them to keep on good terms. The greatest fear that Great Britain and France had. Is that Italy would ally with its old enemy Germany, and they wanted to do anything that they could in order for that to happen. So, what are the lessons of our three case studies? Essentially, what I've done is tried to put into terms what is happening in the 1930s and how these three case studies help to show the greater weaknesses of the League at this time. The first point that I'd like to make is that the league was only as strong as the members and their willingness to play fair. So when Japan and Italy are not playing nicely with the others, essentially it eroded all the members of the League of Nations. The second point that I would make is that countries are still far more concerned about their own interests. Rather than the world interest, and this can be illustrated by what France does in order to preserve its、um, strength in the area. Why Great Britain would be willing to negotiate with fascist Italy instead of taking harsher measures. Essentially, people wanted their own country to be strong, and were not concerned about this new world order. Once again, this grand idea. Of the 14 points, that was Woodrow Wilson's dream at the end of the First World War. And the last point that I would make is that the sheep of the world will have to be slaughtered in order to make peace. And I use the term "sheep" in order to illustrate sort of the small, weaker nations. If smaller nations like Manchuria in China or Abyssinia. Have to be destroyed in order to keep the large nations happy. Well, that's one of the unfortunate consequences of peace in the 1930s. So this is our last focus point in our topic. To what extent was the League of Nations a success? And we'll have a short video at the end that hopefully will wrap all of these focus points together. Thanks for joining me, and we'll talk more in class.